Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Paul writes, if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. My sisters and brothers in Christ, we gather here in the protective shelter of God's healing love. We are free to pour out our grief, to release our anger, to face our emptiness, and to know that God cares. We gather to offer comfort and to support one another in this time of loss, especially remembering Eric's family. We gather to hear God's word of hope that can drive away our despair and move us to offer praise to God. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for coming and sharing in this service today. It is always a very difficult time when we are confronted with the loss of a loved one, but having the support of friends and family around us often helps to ease our pain and gives us the strength to carry on. And I am certain that your presence here today is indeed a true source of strength and comfort for all of the family. I would like to say a very special thank you to the representatives from the Royal Newfoundland Conservatory Constabulary Veterans Association for being here. It's wonderful that you're able to, to come and, and to celebrate and give thanks for one of your colleagues. And also to Reverend Paul Vardy uh, for being here and taking part in the service as well. I would like to extend a warm welcome to those of you who are watching on the live stream as well today. I know that you would much rather be here in person, but please be assured that even though you're not here in body, your spirit is felt among us and we do hope that you feel a part of what we share in this day and that this service will be a blessing for you as well. I would invite you now to turn to the order of service and to join with me as we share together in our prayer of approach. Let us pray. O oh God, creator of all life, help us to accept death as a part of life, trusting in your goodness and great love for every one of us. We feel now the pain of parting with a loved one, but we rejoice that we were privileged to experience life with him. We entrust man's to you in death, as in life you entrusted him to us, we pray in sincerity and hope. Amen. And you'll find in the order of service on, in the inserts our hymns for today. And I would invite you to stand as you are comfortable or able as we sing together, Life is Like a Mountain Railroad.
seated. This time I'd like to share with you a message that has been received by some who aren't able to be here in person. To Aunt Arlene, Uncle Jerry, Aunt Tat, Louie, and Louie and family, we are saddened by Pop Penny's passing. So sorry we cannot be with you today, but our hearts are certainly with you. Pop was always a pleasure to talk with and to be around. As it once was quoted, the candle may go out, but the memory of its light remains. Pop may be gone, but his memories live on. Keep these memories close to your heart and draw from them in the days ahead. Sending thoughts of comfort and all our love, Adrian, Christian, Lane, and family. In your order of service, you'll also find our prayer of confession and our litany of assurance. Once again, let us pray. God of the living and the dead, we are burdened by the weight of our sins. We remember our broken promises and missed opportunities, your gifts we have taken for granted, your love we have not shown or returned. Forgive us, lift our guilt from us, turn us to the face of Christ, that we might walk in the way of salvation. For our sake and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The hope of the resurrection is that God loves us, Christ walks with us in the way, and the breath of the Spirit gives us new life. We are a loved and forgiven people. Thanks be to God. And at this time, we're going to have some words of remembrance. I'm going to ask uh, Jerry if you would like to come forward first, say a few words. If you're more comfortable, you can use that. Okay. Know me. I was, uh, I guess, Mance's first son in law. Uh, I always called him Mr. Penny, and I, I still, right to this day, call him Mr. Penny. Um, and most everybody was known as Mance, and they say to me, he was always Mr. Penny. <clears throat> I first met him in uh, 1982 when I started dating Arlene, the eldest of the, of the family. Um, I briefly met his. his my wife's uh, brother and his son, uh, just once. It was the only opportunity I had to meet him. And uh, he, was an, he was a nice young man, I must say. And uh, shortly before we got married, he passed away, and uh, he, was, he was greatly missed by, uh, by everybody. And uh, <clears throat> his daughter, Tanya, uh, more, you know, most... He, he, most importantly, he was he was a husband to the love of his life, Louise, and I call her Mrs. Penny. <laughs> Early he wrote this for me, so I'm, uh, you know, in June of '83, uh, the tragedy struck, and Roger was involved in a car accident uh, in Nova Scotia. But uh, through all his own grief, Mr. Penny he still remained the rock of the family. And in 84, he became a grandfather, and many years later, a great-grandfather. His three children, seven grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren were his greatest joy. He loved, he loved to see his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. He always had a joke with them and carried on with them. <clears throat> he, Mr. Penny was pretty easy to get along with. Never, in my time with him, never had a, had a bad word. And uh, always had a smile on his face. He was witty and always uh, a good laugh. <laughs> Excuse me. I spent many days listening about his childhood and grow, uh, about growing up in Lethbridge. And when it came to talking about his pets, 
You always, you always talk about flesh. It's, it's goat. <laughs> I got to laugh out of that, but anyway. And uh, <clears throat> he told me one, one of the many careers he had. As, he told me of the many careers he had as a young man. He, ta he taught in South Brook as a very young man. He worked at J.C. Hodgson. Uh, I think that was either just before he joined the force or during as a second job. And he also worked at Newfoundland Margarine. And after he retired from the force, he, uh, he went to work with the City of St. John's in the Parks Division and later as a uh, traffic enforcement officer uh, through the city. He was most proud of his career at the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. Because first, for, I think it was shortly after I started going with Arlene, the new, new uh, Port Townsend building opened. And he was, uh, he wanted to take me down, take me around and have a look at this new building they were in. And I remember Arlene had all your shoes on. And in, I won't repeat exactly what he said, but... Take those shoes off, he said, because you could hear him clip-clopping all the way through the building. <laughs> he was never one to just sit around. You could find him painting houses, helping to build a shed for somebody. Too many projects to count, really. But anything to keep himself busy. <clears throat> he was a man who would give up give you the shirt off his back, but he was also very frugal. Anybody that knew him knew he was frugal. <laughs> he was a man, uh, he always, he would always be making things for the grandkids out of nothing. He made a go-kart for our kids one time out of old pieces of wood and little hubcaps he found off something, I don't know where he got it. He had tail lights and everything on it, so he was pretty handy that way. And uh, even a playhouse, he had done that for the kids. He kept materials most people would throw away and would eventually use those to make different items. <clears throat> he took pride in the homes, in his homes, his main residence on Harris Road here in St. John's, as well as his little cottage on the family land in Lethbridge, which he moved up, he moved that up from Charleston. I gave him a hand to do that actually. You would think he had a heated driveway in the winter here in town, as he was the only one on the street that the pavement was black. There wasn't a bit of snow anywhere. He was always a happy man, enjoyed telling stories and writing short poems, most of which always made you laugh. Even in the last days, he was trying to crack a smile and laugh. And I'm truly grateful for the privilege to of having Mr. Penny in my life, as well as we say our final goodbyes, I know we will find strength in the love he showed us, the laughter we shared, and the countless memories we created together. Rest in peace, Mr. Penny. Thank you. And I'm going to ask Lou if he would come forward as well to share some words of remembrance. I told Louie earlier today that he had to come up in the pulpit and he didn't want to, so now he's got a perfect excuse not there. to have to. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone, for coming. I know Mance would uh, really appreciate everyone's presence here. Um, I wrote a different sort of eulogy. Um, Police have always made me really nervous. Um, <laughs> not in a cops run kind of way, but just, just sort of self-awareness. So um, the first time I arrived to uh, Harris Road for my inaugural visit, um, I was a little anxious. As I approached the front steps, 
um, I could hear that it was really loud inside. Once I was inside and met everyone, I realized loud and chaotic was just the norm in the Penny House. And Mance was totally calm and at ease with all that. And it was a beautiful quality that I admired about him immediately. Jerry called Mance Mr. Penny, as you just heard, but I was introduced to him as Mance. But when Jerry wasn't there, I was called Jerry. <laughs> and then when I didn't respond to that, I was called Chummy. <laughs> I convinced myself that Chummy was some sort of term of endearment Next time Tanya and Chummy returned to Harris Road, we brought a, a very young Taylor and Georgia with us. Mance built, he, Mance was so welcoming, as was Louise, Mance and Louise so welcoming to both of them very early in uh, our relationship, Tanya and I. Mance built little Barbie picnic tables for them, dusted off the old tricycles that he had in the shed, and made them feel so welcome and loved. This is one of my favorite Mance memories. Mance and Louise were, visit were visiting us in Halifax, um, I don't know, probably seven or eight years ago during the winter. We were having one of those sort of crappy winter days like we had yesterday, wind sideways, lots of sort of very uh, recent slush, ice on the road. We were in the car driving on uh, Mumford, Mumford Road. Mumford Road is like sort of uh, uh, Elizabeth Avenue, uh, Portugal Cove Road here. So there's lots of commercial strip malls, uh, apartment buildings, etc. Mance had a really bad hip at the time. So he was in the passenger seat. I was driving. Tanya and Louise were in the back, and then Ginger and Kingston were in the back back. Um, the road goes over a train track bridge for about 40 feet, so there was a little incline and decline. So as we were entering that uh, sort of bridge, uh, we spotted this old fella in one of those uh, electric mobility scooters who was uh, struggling. Uh, he was on the, on the road, not on the sidewalks weren't cleared. He was on the road, sort of on the side of the road, and obviously this thing wasn't getting up the hill. Um, before I could even sort of consider what to do, and the car still moving, Mance bailed out of the car, somehow ran up the icy, slushy, hill to help. Tanya was yelling at me to go help him, but I was literally so stunned to how his hip healed that quickly. <laughs> we slowly caught up to Mance in our car. Mance got Buddy to the top of the hill, hobbled back to the car as if nothing happened. I felt like a complete moron, obviously. That little incident epitomized Mance. He would help anyone, anytime, with anything. Earlier today, I looked up the uh, Royal Newfoundland Constabulary. There are some of, these are some of the published core values of the RNC. Integrity, we are honest, trustworthy, and always strive to do what is right. Respect, we treat each other and those we serve with dignity and respect. Sorry, that's not right. We treat each other and those we serve with dignity and compassion. Mance honored those core, core values all of his life. But the biggest thing I admired about Mance 
was the, that he always just seemed to be content. So content uh, with his life, at ease. Just as it was the first time I met him um, during that chaotic entry at Harris Road. The biggest source of his contentment was his wife, Louise. I wish she was here to witness all the love for her darling, and I hope they are together soon. Tommy loves you. Thank you so much, Louis, to both of you for those wonderful tributes. Are you ready, Arlene? It's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want a minute, we can. I'm going to volunteer. Proper thing. Because I haven't stood up here in a long time. <laughs> You heard say, Dad's ability to write poems. He, was, he could write anything. Over the years, he would pick up paper and pen and write whatever came to mind into a little poem. It just seemed to come so natural to him. And he's passed on this ability to the next generations. So I'm going to read this poem that he wrote, and it certainly is fitting for today. Last night, my little boy knelt down by his bed. He pulled his hands together, and then he bowed his head. He said, Jesus up in heaven, I need to talk to you. My mommy always said, you knew just what to do. I just don't understand why mommy was called away. But daddy said, we will understand it all someday. But since my mommy is gone, all things are not the same. Sometimes at night, I hear Daddy call her name. Please tell my mommy that I am doing good. I'm doing all the things that she said I should. I'm trying very hard to be her little man. And each night before supper, I wash my face and hands. The fourth verse, he never finished. So I finished it. So Dad, I know that you're in heaven. And it's definitely the place that you should be. Because you were the best dad. Now you can live in eternity. I love you, Dad. Thank you, Arlene, for sharing that and for your addition of the last verse. <laughs> as we share together now in God's word as it's revealed in scripture, I'm going to ask Reverend Paul Vardy to come forward and bring to us our first lesson. You can come on up here if you want. Well, make you work the extra few steps. <laughs> First of all, on behalf of uh, Glover Time Pastoral Charge Week, send our condolences to the Penny family. We assure you of our thoughts and prayers. I got to look around and say, wow, this is the church that Mance bragged about time and time again when he was in my presence. I've known Mance and Louise for maybe, oh, 20 years when they would come to Glover Town for visits, and then in recent years when they resided at the seniors' home there. 
almost every conversation we've had was a debate. I would say that Faith United Church in Glovertown was the best. Mance would say it was Wesley United Church in St. John's. And Louise would sit to the sideline and she'd say it was the Salvation Army. <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, whenever Louise sees me, she'll always say, are you the Army officer? <laughs> That's a given. We would always joke about which was the best church. I don't know if we ever agreed on it. But one thing I do know is that Mance and Louise were people who had an amazing faith. An amazing faith. Arlene told me time and time again that her mom and dad, right up till just recent years when they couldn't, every night they would kneel by their bedside and they would offer their prayers to God. That was Mance. Knowing his faith, I share with you our first reading from Romans chapter 8. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. We know that in all things God works for good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sort. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Paul, and I'm so glad you were able to make it for the service today. And now I'm going to ask Jerry Lynn if she would come forward and bring to us our gospel lesson. Reading from the book of John 14. Don't let, uh, sorry, verses 1 through 4. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. Love you, Pop. Thank you, Jerry Lynn. Now I'm going to ask Tanya and Kingston if they would share with us their gift of music.
One by one we'll gain the portal as we'll dwell with the immortals. When we ring the golden bells for you and me. Don't you hear the bells now ringing? Don't you hear the angels singing? Tis a glory shining river when they ring the golden bells for you and me we shall know no sin or sorrow in that heaven of tomorrow when our ship shall sail beyond we shall only know the blessing of our Father's sweet caressing when we ring the golden bells for you and me. Don't you hear the bells? now ringing don't you hear the angels singing tis a glory hallelujah to believe in the far off sweet forever just beyond that shining river When the king commands the spirit to be free, oh, to be free, nevermore with anguish laden, we shall reach that lovely Eden when they ring the golden bells for you. beyond that shining river when they ring the golden bells for you and me when they ring the golden bells for you and me
you so much, Tanya and Kingston. That was absolutely beautiful. Let us pray. May the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips, if they be your words, be acceptable in thy sight. And may your message come to your people now, either through me or despite me. Amen. Mance and Louise have a very long history here at the church, um, active participants, uh, regular worshipers. Uh, but I'd like to share with you a couple of my own stories, my encounters with him. Uh, my first encounter actually um, was shortly after I arrived here at Wesley 20 years ago. And uh, I came in the fall of the year, so worship had just begun picking up again and, and whatnot. And I was trying to meet all of the people, but you could barely do that at the back of the church with a quick handshake. But Mance had a, a habit every once in a while of stopping into the church office. And I was in my office, and I got a, a buzz on the intercom from uh, our church administrator. And she said, uh, Bill, come on out. There's uh, someone I want you to meet. Eric Penny's out here. And I said, oh, okay, very good. So I came out, and uh, it was very nice to meet you, Mr. Penny. And um, he, he said, well, he said, you don't need to be so formal. Uh, you can call me Mance. And I said, oh, I thought your name was Eric. He said, yeah, most people call me Mance. And we were just having a, a little conversation, and he was asking about my family, and he wondered if he had worked with a mercer in the constabulary who was from Bay Roberts, and he says, any relation to yours? And I said, I really don't know. And he said, well, who's your father? I said, my dad is Bill Mercer. And he looked at me, he said, well, that's original. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed, I said, yeah. I said, there's quite a few Bill Mercers in Bay Roberts. Yes, he said, what was his name? I said, well, they called him Billy Ralph. And he said, no, he said, I don't know that one. And he said, what other Bill Mercers are there? And I said, well, I, I list them off. Of course, there was Billy Josh, and there was Billy Governor, and I said, there's Billy Tit. And he said, well, excuse me? And I said, what? He said, my God, he said, this is the first time I've ever heard a minister say that word. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, what, Josh? And he, he said, no. In, in case I spoke too fast, one of the names was Billy Tit. That's what I said. And that was the whole family was the Tit family is from what they called them. I have no idea where it came from, but that was that was his response. He never heard me say I never heard a minister say that word before and I said very good. But anyway, uh, we were only going to talk for about 5 minutes. It was about 45 minutes later he finally said goodbye and was able to go back into the in into I was be able to go back to work. Uh, another one of my things about they used to sit up, up in the balcony, and um, there's two stories related to the balcony. First was, of course, we, we do our collection, um, people would go around with the plates, but it was always sort of hit and miss at who would take up the offering upstairs, but when Mance was there, he would gladly take it up, and he was telling me one day there was a, a visitor, and he went over and he passed the plate, put the plate in front of her, and she opened up her purse, and she was looking through her wallet, and she said, oh my, she said, the smallest I've got's a 20. And he said, that's already said we take 20s. <laughs> so, <laughs> and sure enough, I guess she felt guilted into having to put the $20 bill in the plate, but that was it. Um, one of the things that I, I, I do when I, when I begin a worship service, I'll welcome people to church in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll extend a a warm welcome to visitors, and I always say, I hope that you find us to be a warm and a welcoming congregation. And I can remember one, uh, one Sunday morning meeting uh, a woman downstairs coming out of a visitor, uh, shaking my hand, and she said, you know, uh, who's that greeter upstairs? And I said, I, I don't know what greeter we have upstairs, and, and of course she described your dad. And I said, well, that's Mance Penny. She said, well, he made me indeed feel very welcome here in this place. And that was the common phrasing that you would hear about Mance, that he would speak to everyone up there. He would, a stranger or, or whether they were known to him, he treated everyone the same way and made everyone feel welcome. And, and there was no doubt in my mind just, just how much 
not the church, but the church family meant to, to him. And he was such a vital uh, and important and loving part of it. And, uh, you know, when we heard of his passing, there were many people said, oh my, and they, they'd all share their memories of, of how precious a man he was. Um, but the thing I want to focus on today is, is actually something that, that Paul Vardy shared with you. Both he and Louise were people of great faith. And as we gather here this day, we do so with heavy hearts. A precious loved one has been taken from our midst. But we gather, as Paul would say, to grieve, but not to grieve as those who have no hope. For we do have that hope in Christ, and it was a hope that, that Mance believed in, that Louise shares in, that all of the family is well aware of and believes in. And when we were putting together the service, <clears throat> Arlene shared with me that one of the readings was going to be from John's Gospel, the, the passage that Jerry Lynn shared. And actually, that is one of the passages that I often use at a funeral. And I do it for a very specific reason. The reason being that these are words that Jesus spoke to his closest friends at the Last Supper to prepare them for the kind of emotions that you as a family are going through today. Jesus knew that the next day he was going to die on the cross on Good Friday, and all of his disciples were going to be witness to that. They would be gathered there among all of the crowds, hearing the crowds cheering, laughing, mocking Jesus. They would watch him die an agonizing death. They would be filled with a great sense of sorrow and grief and loss. They would be touched by anger, directed at God and directed at the crowds, and they would be filled with a sense of almost hopelessness as to wondering where they would go, how they would carry on without him in their lives. And, and if you think about it, we, re, we go through those same emotions, that, that overwhelming sense of grief, that hint of anger. Sometimes we're angry at God for taking our loved ones from us. Sometimes we're angry at the world around. As we gather here in this sanctuary, the traffic still goes by on Patrick Street and Hamilton Avenue, and sometimes we just want to yell at the world and tell them to stop. We're grieving. Others should be too. <coughs> and then there's that sense of where do we go from here? How do we carry on without him in our lives? And Jesus wanted to give his disciples a word of hope and a word of promise. And he told them that, in essence, I'm going to die tomorrow, but there's a reason for my dying, and that reason is to go to heaven to prepare a place for you. So that when you come to the end of your lives, I'll be there to meet you, to bring you to be with me once again. Uh, normally, when I use the, this passage, I, I use the, the translation that reads, In my father's house are many mansions. Uh, because in that particular passage, Jesus uses a, an image of what heaven could be. For his disciples, he picked an image of a house in which they would all dwell within. Because the image of home was one which was very important for his disciples. They'd left their homes, their families, in order to follow Jesus. And he wanted them to know that their sacrifice was not in vain. That when they came to the end of their lives, there would be waiting for them not only a home, but a term equivalent to our term mansion, uh, an indication, something far greater than they would have had on earth. And the promise that comes to us is that there is something far greater that awaits each and every one of us, a greater kingdom, a greater glory. But what Jesus did with his words was that he freed us to think about heaven in terms that can bring us comfort. For his disciples, they could think about that mansion. But you're able to think about man's being wherever you might want him to be or need him to be. And I've shared this story at countless funerals. I'm going to share it again. Um, I lost my dad 28 years ago. And when I think about heaven for my dad, I think about that place where the Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> And everyone laughs at that and whatnot, and, and it's, you know, it's humorous, but that really is the image I have for him. And the reason being, I was, on, I was five years old back in 67, the last time the Leafs won the Cup. 
And I was allowed to stay up late. Growing up in Toronto, we bled white and blue, so Toronto was it. And I was allowed to stay up to watch the playoffs. And when the Leafs finally won the cup, my father, who was a, he was a short man, was seated on the couch, and he jumped up off the couch with his two fists over his head, and he punched two holes in the ceiling of our living room. <laughs> and it's the happiest image that I have of my dad. And that's what I want heaven to be for him, that happy image. So that's the image I choose. It doesn't matter what, what the image is. You're free to think of man's being wherever you need him to be that can give you that peace of mind and peace of spirit. It's not the image that's important. The, the, what's important is the truth behind the image. The sad part of the truth is that our earthly journeys come to an end. But the beautiful part of God's truth is that this is not the end. That there is eternal life waiting each and every one of us. The other promise that Jesus offered his disciples was not only would they see him, but they would see each other again. There would be that great reunion. And, and I believe that in my heart of hearts as well. That when we pass from this world that we're reunited with our loved ones in God's greater kingdom. Not only do we come face to face with God but we come face to face with all of those loved ones who passed before us. And I'm certain that when man's died, God would have been one of the very first hearts to break. And he would have been there to meet him on the other side, but standing right alongside of him would have been all of the loved ones who had gone before. And I know that time will come when he'll be waiting to see you once again. And I, I say this to you in particular, Louise, I know that as you're watching, your heart is breaking, but one day you'll be with him once more. That's the beautiful promise that God gives to us. But until that time comes, God gives us a, the precious gift of memory. And it's in our memories that our loved ones live on. It's in our memories that they are an actual physical part of our daily living. I believe that they, they're with us in so many different ways. And again, I'll share with you my own personal experience. I lost my mom over 30 years ago. And one of the fondest memories I have of my mom was when I was a young boy coming home from school. I'd be allowed to watch television before supper. Then you'd eat supper, and then it was homework, and then it was off to bed. So every morning, I would be excited to get home to watch my two favorite shows, Gilligan's Island and Hogan's Heroes. But in order to watch Gilligan's Island and Hogan's Heroes, I had to sit through Days of Our Lives and Another World. And I grew up with the old characters, Rachel and Mac and Alice and Steve and all of that crowd. And while I was watching those soaps, waiting my turn, I would lie down on the couch and I'd rest my head on my mom's lap. And we would talk. She'd ask me about school. I'd ask her what she did during the day, and while we were talking, she used to just take her fingers, and she would lightly brush through my hair. And I tell you without a word of exaggeration, in those 30-plus years, there hasn't been one day that has passed where at some point in the day, I don't sit back, just close my eyes, and I can feel her fingers as real a touch as it was all those years ago. The only difference is for some reason now, she doesn't play with the top of my head. <laughs> but that is what that gift of memory does for us. It allows us not just to remember fondly, it allows us to, to remember in such a way that our loved ones never truly leave us. And it's my hope and prayer that the memories that you have of Mance will touch you in that same way, that you'll be able to feel him with you each and every day until that time comes when you will see him again face to face. So let us give God thanks and praise for man's life and his love and his legacy. Let us commend him into God's eternal care and keeping. And let us commend ourselves into that same care and keeping and go forward in faith knowing that one day, we shall all meet again. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you for all the blessings of life. 
for watching over us in death and for all the ways in which we come to know your love. We thank you for those who share our lives, for families and loved ones, for caregivers and companions, for friends and neighbors. And especially today, we thank you for Mance. We praise you for the gift of his life, for all in him that was generous and kind, for the love that he gave and received, for the grace that enabled him to serve you faithfully, and for all that lives on through those who knew and loved him. We thank you that for him death is past, pain is ended, and he has entered the joy of your presence. Comforting and caring God, we pray for all of his family and his friends. We think in particular this day of his lifelong love, Louise. And we ask that they would all know the comfort of your love through the support of others, and through the peace of your presence. And guide us all as we seek to offer support and care, healing and hope to those who feel his loss. Strong and tender God, in, in Jesus you share the joy and sorrow of this life, and so we pray also for all others who know suffering and pain. Grant us all a vision of your purpose in our life and work together that we may bear witness to the hope which is in Jesus Christ. And we pray together now as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Just before we sing our closing hymn, I would extend an invitation to you on behalf of the family following this service to join with them downstairs in our fellowship hall as they continue to celebrate Mance's life over refreshments. So please feel free to join with us. Now I would invite you to stand as you are comfortable or able as we sing our closing hymn, The Last Mile of the Way.
You only are immortal, the creator of all. We are mortal, formed of the earth, and to the earth shall we return. This you ordained when you created us, saying you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant Mance, with all your saints, where there is neither pain nor sorrow nor sighing, but life everlasting. And into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Mance Penny. Acknowledge we humbly pray thee as sheep of your fold, a lamb of your flock, a son of your redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to smile upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you, give you always his blessing and his peace. Amen. In and with the peace of Christ.